So, um, you know, we know now that we have, um, you know, pembrolizumab approved as, uh, you know, monotherapy for more than 50%. Um, should we be using uh, monotherapy for everyone more than 50% or is there situations where you would use uh, uh, chemotherapy and immunotherapy in combination? Um, Leora, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, you know, a lot of people discuss that maybe the chemo IO combo, particularly in those patients over 50%, we saw from Keynote 189 that the response rate was higher than what we see with pembrolizumab monotherapy, where the response rates are in 50%, and with the combo response rates are over 70%. So maybe if you have this patient who's rapidly progressing, who you want to get a quick response. To be honest, a couple of times that I've done that, the patient rapidly deteriorated and ended up in the hospital with a complication of their therapy. So I am not a big fan of the Pembro chemo combo when they're over 50% and symptomatic. You know, maybe it's a lung mass and you can rather radiate and still use Pembro monotherapy. Um, but there are some folks who think that in those patients over 50% who have a high symptom burden, that maybe with monotherapy we'll get uh, quicker symptom relief. Tim, do you want to comment on whether uh, some of the upfront radiation can be useful to sort of manage? Um, sort of um, acute issues? I mean, certainly there's a growing body of evidence that using radiation in conjunction with early immunotherapy um, seems to augment the systemic response. Um, so we tend to have a low threshold for finding a reason uh, to palliate something. So if there's a borderline lesion at the hilum that might be threatening the central airway, um, we'll often um, radiate that in kind of a prophylactic palliation uh, framework uh, in someone who's gonna get single agent uh, monotherapy um, in effort to, you know, keep them locally controlled, but also potentially augment their systemic control. And I, I think I, I'm not sure I completely agree with Lior. I, I think for patients that have a lot of disease and a lot of osseous disease, very symptomatic, I get a little nervous about just pembro monotherapy um, uh, in, in the more than 50% group. Josh, do you, what are your thoughts? And maybe Jacob can comment as well. I think that the fact is that PDL1 is not a great biomarker. So I don't have a lot of confidence. When I see PDL1 greater than 50%, it's not like EGFR. I see EGFR, I'm going to give a drug, I know that it's going to work, or I'm pretty darn confident. Um, so I would tend to agree with you, Nair, that if I have a patient with greater than 50% with it presents in extremis, um, I feel like I only have one shot on goal. Now, Leora, I think you're right as well. A lot of the times they end up in the hospital because they're so sick, but I feel like if I have one shot on goal, I want to sort of go with all guns blazing here and use chemo IO, but that is a small percentage of my patients. Um, someone really has to be quite ill for me to say that that's the approach that I'd use. The vast majority of my patients with greater than 50%, I give pembrolizumab monotherapy. If you look at the overall survival data, um, not comparing just ORR, look at the overall survival data. The medians are pretty similar for the greater than 50% on Keynote 189, Keynote 407, um, and, um, and Keynote 24. So I feel pretty comfortable with it. It's that early phase that I get a little worried about. Jacob? Yeah, I agree. I, if I have a patient who's really symptomatic, uh, I recently someone who had a big pleural effusion and bulky disease and was very symptomatic from it, uh, young, healthy, I ended up doing the combination of chemo plus pembro uh, to increase the likelihood of response. Unfortunately, she's done well. And, you know, you can't draw conclusions from one individual. And obviously, we do better by putting all the data together and letting that drive um, the decision making. But otherwise, I mean, aside from those like bulky, trying to really get as much of a response as early as possible, I tend to use pembro monotherapy. But I'll also add, you know, we talk about greater than 50% because that's really where the bulk of the data is. But there are data sets uh, recently published out there looking at um, in 10% 10, uh, 10 uh, groups. So 50 to 60, 60 to 70, 70 to 80 and up. And, and that greater than 50 isn't all the same either. So when you have someone with a greater than 90%, it looks like there are even higher likelihood of response. And so someone with a 55% versus someone with a 95% likely have a significant um, uh, uh, differences in median outcomes as well. Now, how that much, you know, that particularly drives decision making. Well, that comes down to when you have that person where you're trying to get as much of a response and 
and outcomes from um, where if they've got a 95% uh, of pd one expression versus a 55%, those might not actually be the same population either. So essentially what I'm saying is the majority of patients greater than 50%, I will treat with Pembro alone. Uh, in someone who I really want to get as much of a response as I can, I'll do the combination, even if it's greater than 50%. But then also just raising the topic of even that greater than 50% group isn't all the same either. And, and as you see increasing uh, pd one expression, we, we may actually have uh, differences within those, within those patients as well. But Jacob, it, it's interesting because that portion, that was a great paper that came out of your group. It was really, really interesting. But I've been finding that our pathologists really score it in a rather bimodal fashion, right? They know that 50% is the cutoff, so they'll say 50%, and they won't really break it down 65%. I don't think they're doing as much cell counting. Uh, I think that as we go into AI-based assessment of this, we may get more precision and more of a bell-shaped curve. But for now, it ends up being a lot of peaks at zero and a lot of peaks at 50. Um, to really... You're absolutely right, and it is interesting, but that's where those 10% ranges end up being kind of helpful in that analysis. Because I agree, if someone was, if you're looking at just 55% or 50% versus those that are 95%, um, and, and those being different, that could also just be user saying, you know, taking anyone who's like in the 50-ish range and calling them 50, 55. Um, so you may be very well, that, 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 that's a very good point. Um, but also in those 10% ranges, it does seem like there's some legitimacy to that as well. And, and at the same time, you know, also recognizing there's a lot for us to learn. And even biopsies from different areas will give you different percents uh, of pdl one expression. So no one of those really is, that, that's not something that ends up being all the tumor that they have has that percentage. It can, it can range from sites you biopsy. So back to your earlier point that pdl one is certainly not a perfect uh, test. Um, there, there's still a lot for us to learn from this. So we, we kind of categorize it as best we can. Generally greater than 50%, I do single agent uh, pembrolizumab, but in those patients where I really want to get a response as quickly as possible, and I think they can tolerate it, I'll do the combination. 